A drill, I tell you. A little neoliberal network of parochialism and provincialism, that's what it is. And that, we can put that on tape, I've said that many times. <laughs> All right, let us jump right into talking about, uh, talking about Freud, Marcuse, Roland Barthes as well. Uh, it's fairly clear that we have now moved to the more darker and bleak moments in this class. It has to do with how do you really come to terms <laughs> with the possibility of sustaining hope, any sense of happiness, any sense of possibility and promise in the face of overwhelming impulses and drives and desires. But of course, what goes hand in hand with the subject matter in this class and what we're talking about this particular week is it's hard to separate those four components that Brother Roberto and Professor Unger began with at the very beginning of the first class, which had to do with, as you recall, death and mortality, inescapable and unavoidability of death in all of its various forms and the insatiability of desire. What happens when you actually plunge yourself within the palypsis of desire in all of its various forms? Not just the titillation and stimulation of contemporary market culture, but those deeper desires, even those sublimated desires, desire for truth and goodness and beauty and the holy. Freud is going after big fish. He thinks that religion, he thinks that art, he thinks that paideia, the highest forms of religion, are all sublimated forms of desire that simply recast energies, the libidos, in forms that try to get us to defeat time, to get us to hold time at arm's length because of our not just fear of death, but he believes, in fact, after 1920, in his classic Beyond the Pleasure <coughs> Principle, he believes that the end of life is death. He believes there's a death instinct that cuts beneath all of the chatter, all of the discourses, all of the conversations about reason and justice and democracy and equality. He says the prehistory of the species is still at work within modern life. And of course, he's writing this precisely after that most barbaric of wars at the very center of so-called civilized Europe, World War one, and of course psychoanalysis had already began about 15 years earlier, but it really begins to flourish when you got the influx of these soldiers having to reflect on their trauma, on the, the shell shock of the war. And this, these, atrocities, these atrocities and barbarities and brutalities that are being reported, and of course on the way to World War II, even more barbaric, even more brutal, even more cruel. Uh, we had chance to uh, actually read a kind of genealogy of Freud's uh, trajectory of psychoanalysis. We would read three short essays, one called On Transience. War has taught us that all of the higher ideals of humankind actually, for the most part, are empty and simply displacements of something much darker that resides at the very center of the human soul and at the very center of human culture. And what is at the center of human culture in his classic of 1930, Civilization and Its Discontent? It's actually published in 1929, it's the end of the year, but it's at 1930 in the text, so we'll just say what's in the text. 1930, the sense of guilt. The sense of guilt. What is the sense of guilt? It's the renunciation of the instincts. It is the repression of the desires. It is the internalization of consciousness, of conscience and guilt that create some moral self, some ego driven by id, but also regulated by superego. What is that superego? It's authority. Mom, dad, school, church, mosque, synagogue, and so forth. So what we're talking about this week, and we're going to be pushing again our dear brother Roberto because he's always on the up and up in terms of talking about transformation, <laughs> possibility, <laughs> transcendence. And there's Freud sitting there looking at him. Brazilian that you are, New Worlder that you are, 
Don't you realize that what sits at the very center of any mature Belton Shawan is the death instinct. It is the repetition of the trauma going back to the site of the trauma and attempt to master that trauma reinforces the trauma even deeper, even deeper on the psychic level, individual, or on the social level. You say, but Freud, my God, why all this bleakness? He says, I'm Jewish by origin. I'm proud to be from modern Ukraine. I'm trained at the University of Vienna. I'm dealing with vicious anti-Jewish hatred in Vienna, which was the center and the major site of anti-Jewish hatred even before Hitler takes off. Of course, Hitler matriculates to Vienna in his early years. He says, but, in, but at the same time, I'm also a modern pagan. Look for me in the legacy of Athens as opposed to look for me in the legacy of Jerusalem. So just because I'm Jewish in origin, don't think that I have this tilt toward spreading hesed to the orphans and the widows and the weak and the vulnerable and have this sensitivity and empathy toward the poor and working classes. No, that's a Judaic thing. Don't confuse Judea, Judaism with my Jewish origin. I'm a pagan. I read Thucydides. I read Sophocles. That's why I'm a kissing cousin of Nietzsche, because he was also a modern pagan, even though he had six generations of Lutheran pastors in his family. Now, what are the claims of Freud in 1930? The first claim is every civilization is fundamentally rooted in some form of barbarism some form of primary narcissism and primitive instincts that is trying to tame. It's almost a kind of a, 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 a ship, a float. And sooner or later, those waters will overturn it. Sooner or later, the destructive tendencies, the destructive impulses will take place. Now, of course, these days, people are saying, well, the return of the press, the return of the repressed, it's like Brother Trump in the White House. All of those white supremacists, misogynist, sexist, xenophobic, transphobic tendencies shot through the history of the United States returning now with the president. And Freud's, you ask Freud, what, what about the best? Oh, no, the best is there, he said. The best is there. There are certain sublimated forms of energy that are highly recommendable, it's just that they are relatively impotent. Relatively impotent. For Freud, it's only two, work and love. Work and love. And Marcuse is going to make so much of work and so with Fourier. Because anytime you talk about wrestling with the mortality, wrestling with <laughs> the insatiability of desires, wrestling with groundlessness and wrestling with belittlement, the connection between the self and society, the connection between the psyche and the larger structure, the connection between the existential and the economic, the personal and the political, we must never lose sight of. Freud does. He doesn't have a whole lot to say about the institution and structure because he sees it as a kind of extension of what goes on inside of each and every one of us. He said, you can talk about structural transformation all you want, but if you've got to deal with these kind of damaged organisms called human beings, you're not going to get too far. Reminds me of that wonderful line in the greatest play ever written, God bless you, the greatest play ever written in the history of America called The Iceman Cometh by Irish genius named Eugene O'Neill. It's about a four and a half hour play, so it's not often performed, even though, thank God, the greatest American actor alive is taking up Hickey next year. His name is Denzel Washington. He's going to try to put the enact Hickey. I'm praying for that Negro because that's a hell of a role. But he's going to be able to pull it off. I got great confidence in it. But if you've never seen The Iceman Cometh, which is the bleakest of all modern American plays, but that line that says, you can't make a mansion out of mud and manure. And that mansion is ut utopian possibility, fundamental transformation, revolution. You can't do it because the very folk who are part and parcel of the revolution are mud and manure, so damaged. 
so traumatized, so terrorized by death, terrorized by disease, terrorized by insecurities, fears, and anxiety, so unwilling to really want to candidly and unflinchingly come to terms with who they really are. Now, that's Eugene O'Neill. He gets it from Strindberg. But it's a similar conclusion. That's what makes this week a profoundly challenging one. We're going to be talking about Christianity with Kierkegaard and, uh, and Hegel and Rahner and, and, and Bart the next two weeks before we get to another dark moment with Schopenhauer. But I don't want us to in any way uh, run away from the darkness of this particular week. That first claim about civilizations being predicated on forms of barbarism, the second claim about the tremendous difficulty of human beings making the trek from chronic neurosis to normal unhappiness. Because that's what psychoanalysis is all about. <laughs> that's really what it's all about. Right? All these neuroses discombobulating you, incapacitating you, paralyzing you. You got a little cash? Meet me in my office. Because <laughs> I've got some ways of recovering and recuperating some elements about you that might allow you to cope so you can move from profound misery to everyday unhappiness. <laughs> Freud is honest. <laughs> He's got a profoundly tragic view of the human condition. But he believes that logos plays a role, reason still plays a role, but it's interpretive. It's existential hermeneutics. It's an interpretive act, and through self-reflection, you can be self-transformed, but the move that you make is from a deep darkness to a relative darkness. And what's awaiting you is extinction. Very soon. Very soon. And Freud is very explicit about the, uh, the various escapes that he puts Forward. He spends a lot of time talking about intoxicants. Because for large numbers of our precious fellow human beings who look the darkness of the human condition in the face, they say, I need self-medication. I need some intoxication. Let me get to the crack house. Let me get to the weed shop. Let me get to sexual addiction. Let me get to success addiction. Let me get to addiction to fame. Let me get to addiction to spectacle. All of these are flights in light of that deep bleakness that Freud is talking about that sits at the very center. And of course, this is a very important cr critique of the academy and the ways in which academic activity is sublimated energy trying to to engage in forms of flight from bleakness that gives some significance for your life in the short time that you are here and reinforces the kind of addiction to being smart, or the addiction to feeling good about being in a high status place. All of those various sublimated activities that provide some kind of rationalization for not confronting the destructive instincts inside of each and every one of us. And Freud himself was quite honest about his own uh, addictions as well. We know that he, uh, well, we won't get into it, but <laughs> he and Charles Lamb had a whole lot in common, let's put it that way, a whole lot in common, especially when the pain hit with his jaw. He had 30 operations at the end of his life, very much like one of the great geniuses of our day. Dearly beloved Prince of Minneapolis, the painkillers became a source of fighting off the pain, but also reinforcing, reinforcing the addiction. That line in Marcuse, the, the wounds that seemingly heal in time are also the wounds that carry the poison that sooner or later hunt you down, that sooner or later push you 
over the cliff. The Janice face character of desire, the Janice face character of wounds, the Janice face character of sorrow. And yes, the Janice face character of quest for happiness. Now there's a moment in Freud's civilization discontents, one of the rare moments actually, and I hope, I'm sure many of you caught it in reading today's assignment. Where Freud says there's something that psychoanalysis has absolutely nothing to say about. What is that, Sigmund? Beauty. Beauty. Now, he's written some interesting essays on jokes in 1905, on humor. But when it comes to beauty, the enjoyment of beauty, what is the origins of beauty, what is the function of beauty, what is the role of beauty, he's, of course, very, very much a Darwinian. And so he's wondering, how does the emergence of the preoccupation of beauty by human beings play a role in our evolutionary development as a species? We know the story of orchids in Darwin. <coughs> Richard Rorty was so crazy about it. Richard Rorty wrote a wonderful essay called Trotsky and the Orchids, because he started off as his father's a left-wing Trotskyite, but he fell in love with orchids, and orchids is one of the things that preoccupied Charles Darwin because he could never determine what was its role and function in the history of, national, of natural selection. It seemed to be thoroughly useless, not reducible to the theory, but it's there and it's beautiful. John Hope Franklin, we got our dear brother Professor Callahan here, is one of the great biblical scholars of our time, courageous, visionary, sacrificial, bouncing back from Brazil and the United States. I met him when he was a professor here at Harvard. So good to see you, though, brother. It's a blessing to see you. Blessing to see you. But, the, uh, but, but, this, but this notion of something so beautiful not being reducible to the naturalistic theories of science, not reducible to the physicalistic theories of the physics departments and so on. And that's precisely where Marcuse begins. Precisely where he begins. Because Marcuse looks Freud's darkness in the face and says, can we still use the imagination and empathy, but especially imagination, as a way of envisioning a self and society that's beyond renunciation, beyond repression, that connects pleasure to freedom rather than pleasure to repression of desire. Is it possible to project utopian possibilities in a Freudian world? And this is where you get this hyper hybrid. And by a hyper hybrid, I mean a convoluted, complicated, often unpersuasive but rich marriage of Marx and Freud in that classic of 1955, Eros and Civilization. And what's at the center of it? He says, all utopian thought is rooted in the memory of some plenitude. And so remembrance Memory, historical recuperation, will sit at the very center of Marcuse's attempt to deal with <laughs> all of the modern talk about technological progress and its linked to forms of barbarism. All of the material breakthroughs and its critique and, and its links to forms of atrocity. From cell phones, to hydrogen bombs, from drone strikes to 54.5 inch screen television. And they call them flat something. What, what do they call these TVs nowadays? Flat screen. Flat screen. That's what it is, flat screen. That's what it's flat screen. I was told that the other day. I said, ooh, I, didn't, I guess I had a fat one. It's flat screens now. Unbelievable comfort. Unbelievable conven convenience. Escalating forms of surveillance. Escalating forms of regimentation. 
escalating forms of very subtle, if not indoctrination, pushing folk in certain directions and thinking they are freely choosing as they are pushed. What Marcuse calls repressive tolerance. And he has a whole essay on that, but of course he doesn't go into this in his particular text. And he goes back to the Greeks. Who are the two figures? Orpheus, Narcissus. Fascinating move. Fascinating move. What is it about Orpheus? Song, art, inseparable from death, from Hades. But in song and art, there seems to be a coming together of freedom and pleasure. And there seems to be moments in that coming together of freedom and pleasure where you get some distance from your wounds and your bruises and your scars. Now, of course, right now, I could just put on Al Green, Simply Beautiful, and sit out. <laughs> If you haven't heard Al Green sing Simply Beautiful, you haven't lived yet, <laughs> at least as long as you should. Just go home tonight and listen to it. Simply beautiful. All of that rich, subtle orality manifest in sonic form that provides a way of your sense of self and soul finding home, though you are exilic homeless creatures finding a sense of home in song that creates a utopian possibility that maybe, in fact, is not simply about renunciation of instincts and the repression of desires. It's about the exfoliation of various desires in song that provide a fusion of the pleasure and freedom simultaneously. And it's just the appetite. It's just the foretaste almost a kind of realized eschatology in which some far away utopian can be, con you can make some connection with it, can be tasted in a particular moment in space and time. And what's interesting about his read of Narcissus is what? It's not the traditional read. When we think about Narcissus, we think of what these days? Exactly, Narcissism, famous classic of Christopher Lash in 1979, that culture of narcissism, the inability of people to get outside of their own egos, to always reduce everything to their own fears and insecurities and anxieties, and thereby, thereby, thereby ending up living their lives navel-gazing rather than being other-regarding. That's not the narcissist he invokes. The, the narcissist he invokes is a narcissist who, one, doesn't even know the images he is, and two, is trying to f engage in flight from the river of time. You see, he's trying to get out of time. You see, trying to look for a way outside of time. You see, and that temporality which is tied to historicity. And historicity, God bless you, is tied to the conflict and contestation and all the sufferings and all the sorrows, but also the joys, also the joys. And for Marcuse, there has to be some way of eroticizing the body by song and by defeating time. And what does he say? Don't be seduced by the power of his language as opposed to the persuasiveness of his argument, because he is poetic at times. But he says, time is defeated by remembrance that redeems the past. That the only way you defeat time is ironically through a certain kind of remembrance that gives gravitas to who you are so that you're able to live as if you are defeating time, though you're still in time, but that remembrance elevates you. And he says, remembrance is the greatest psychological achievement of the species. The ability to remember. Now that takes us right back to the legacy of Jerusalem. That's what Hebrew scripture is all about. 
to remember to believe. To believe is to remember. And that remembrance is tied to a reverence to get outside of yourself. And it's tied to a re revolutionary orientation of being in the world but not of the world. And of course, for Christians, it's not just revolutionary, it's resurrectionary. It turns you upside down and it turns the world upside down because what you do remember is the love warriors, especially that particular love warrior on that tree in Calvary and that blood that flows from that love. So that, re that remembers has an unbelievable anchorage in a love that breaks the back of a bleakness, but it doesn't push aside the bleakness. All it does is empower you in that bleakness not to succumb to the worst of it, which in part is what that cross is all about for many theologians. And for our Jewish brothers and sisters still locked into Judaism, unlike Freud, but locked into Judaism, is that remembrance of a people who were in Egypt, who were delivered, who tried to be true to that hesed that spread to orphan and widow and so forth and so on. And then our precious Muslim brothers and sisters go on and take it to a whole different new level in terms of incorporating all of the Judaism and the Christianity with Muhammad. But we won't get into all of that now. But the important thing to keep that as part of this particular legacy of Jerusalem that is in deep conflict with our, our, our pre-modern and modern pagan brothers uh, and sisters, be it Plato, Aristotle, Sophocles, Euripides, or be it a Freud, or be it a David Hume, or a whole host of moderns who look at the modern world and say the only way is by turning to the Greeks. And by turning to the Greeks, you're turning to various methodological formulations or artistic insights of great profundity that can help sustain you in this river of time. Now, Professor Unger has already situated each and every one of us in this river of time with that, that mortality, with the groundlessness, with the belittlement, and, and with what's, what was the fourth one? Insatiability. And the insatiability. Brief word on Charles Fourier. It's just fun reading Fourier. It's clear he's out of control. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Ooh. I mean, like my dear Mormon brother, Joseph Smith. You know, you read Joseph Smith and you got all of this stuff going on in the cosmos. You say, Joe, it's just too complicated. It's too <laughs> but it's powerful. And I'm not putting it down. I'm a Mormon brother and sisters, I'm not putting you down. I just came back from Utah two weeks ago. I like it out there. Got good manners like Canadians, you know what I mean? <laughs> but we're talking about the imagination. And Fourier's imagination is unbelievable. But what sits at the center of his Weltanschauung is what? How do we transform arduous labor into playful pleasure? So that's a structural question, and that's a psychological question. And he's obsessed with love and food. So he's got all the numbers. He's very Pythagorean in that sense. He's got all the different numbers of how many different kinds of cheeses and meats and how much it go in and how long. And you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning because your body is on a rhythm. You say, Charles, please. Charles, please, settle down. <laughs> settle down. <laughs> Too much high temperature. This is supposed to be about pleasure. Take your time, brother. Slow down. But it's crucial because it is a philosophical and theoretical rupture for most of the Western tradition that does not connect pleasure and labor, that runs away from the pleasures of food and the pleasures of love. He's one of the first brothers in high five <coughs> European intelligentsia to defend thoroughly the pleasures of gay life and gay sexuality and so forth, you see. Why? Because he just knows that there's variety, diversity, and heterogeneity. And every culture predicated on renunciation and repression has got to police it. So you got patriarchal police lines. You got, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
got to racially police it, got to police it based on class-based rules and so forth. He wants to shatter all of that, shatter all of that. So it's a kind of transgression on steroids. But it's fascinating, and it goes in a lot of different directions. Marquis de Sade is doing similar kind of thing in a very different kind of way, <laughs> in a very different kind of way. It's almost celebrations of various kinds of cruelties and so forth and so on. But it's the kind of thing that allows us to stretch our minds and broaden our imaginations. But most importantly, what we want to talk about, I'm going to end here, is the ways in which this particular bleak moment in this class is one that tries to get us to stretch our minds, even as we may, in the end, be unconvinced. Questions, queries, do not hesitate. Yes? That sounds good to me. I would say that that point of view is very person centric, very human centric. The That's beauty right. of the orchid is meant to, the, to attract the bumblebee who pollinates the orchid and carries the species along in various places on the earth. That's natural nothing to do with the, the point of view of the human or the uh, opinion that the orchid is beautiful. So science is very much involved. The second point is, I don't want to be too humorous about it, but I think I heard you say that that uh, mud and manure cannot make uh, the, the ideal castle. A mansion. The, the quote from Eugene O'Neill. To get to the mansion, you got to what, though, brother? You got to eat. Oh, you got to eat? Yeah. Oh, I I'm see. I see. No, I appreciate your tilt toward the scientific uh, because there's always ways in which we can cast our interpretations and descriptions of these various poetic expressions. I think what Eugene O'Neill had in mind was uh, this Promethean level of civilization in which you've got the arts and the crafts and the tools and, and arguments and visions and texts and so forth. And that still is a kind of leap because the imagination is concerned with making leaps. It's not a matter of some quantitative continuum based on naturalistic processes. Now again, you know, he can be accused of being an idealist. He can be accused of being uh, someone who doesn't take Darwin as seriously as he ought. But he's a poet, so we've got to give him some poetic license. This is in the context of a dialogue in Harry Hope's saloon in the Iceman Compass on the stage in 1956. So that's, now the, the point about orchids, though, I think you're absolutely right, that we are looking at it from the vantage point of human beings. But in the end, the notion of being impartial and looking at anything through lens other than human beings is something that many are highly suspicious of. So even when the physicists claim that they are somehow looking at it in a non-humanistic, impartial way, you can imagine Freud and the others saying, following Fallbach and the others, appreciate the effort. It's a grand attempt to look at the world in an impartial way. But in the end, there's still elements of partiality still operating in what you're doing. Let's be candid about it. And then, what does the orchid mean to you, not what does it mean to the bee? Not what does it mean to the evolution of the natural processes tied to the bee doing their thing. So I appreciate both points, but you see, you see where I'm going on both. But jump right in. Uh, I really thank you, Professor. Let's see if you can find a question in here somewhere. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can we talk about it a bit last week with Emerson? Yeah. And Where does that fit into how do we reconcile the pleasure pain? How do we do all of that and live with other people at the same time? What's going on? Yeah. 
No, it's a very important question and comment, though. You remember there's a moment in our reading this week where Freud talks about those who opt for love as a way of life. And he has a paragraph. And he says, this is one of the most dangerous ways of being in the world precisely because it leads to a defenselessness that those who actually opt for love are putting themselves in a situation in which they are more naked existentially and more defense, lack defense, so that they will be hurt in some way, even deeper, precisely because they are surrendering themselves. So that's part of the paradox that, uh, that, that Brother Roberto Fess Unger is talking about. And uh, it is, it's, it's quite a moment in Freud, because you're right, Freud has a very Hobbesian conception of, uh, uh, of, of human condition in terms of survival of the slickest dog eat dog, uh, uh, with wolves to each other and what have you. But he's got that moment. Now he goes on to say that there are some joys in that self-surrender. But it's inseparable from the pain, the sorrow, the loss, what he says, when you, when, when you lose the loved one, there's levels of hurt, levels of pain that uh, are uh, well, just deep levels of hurt and pain, let me put it that way. So that's one of the ways in which he's responding to Roberto. So him, but we'll, let's see if we got any sisters, any uh, women who want to raise some questions. Yes, my dear sister, we'll come right back. Yes. Needs and expression, and I kept thinking, well, this is a report from a small section of humanity. Women were not really counted in this, women were uh, non European. So I kept thinking, I kept having to remind myself that this is the point of view of a section of humanity and not the whole that it often sort of claims to be. Oh, no, that's true. I mean, that's true for any of these text that we would read or any classroom and so on. But the challenge is, is it the case that those groups that are not heard at the moment in our classroom are not also wrestling with various kinds of uh, drives and instincts and shaped by domination and subjugation and so forth and so on. Because I mean, remember Marcuse talks about um, the ways in which cultures make a, put a premium on oppressed people, not just consenting to their own oppression, but imitating their oppressors and thinking that's the way of being in the world. And that is a very elaborate kind of ideological uh, operation that takes place. Therefore, the idea of thinking, well, if we, if we had these folk from uh, Africa or Asia, or you had indigenous people from Central America and so forth, their voices must ne in no way be viewed as an extension of what we're reading. They've got their own rich traditions and practices and civilizations, but they also have their own structures of domination. They got their own kinds of patriarchy, they got their own kinds of elite rule and so forth and so on. You see. So that that's a way of trying to get at your question without in any way devaluing the importance of your because it is very important that, uh, uh, that we have a variety of, of, of voices as part of this conversation. I saw a hand over here, though. Uh, Professor West, in your list of, um, when you're talking about addiction and how um, um, community, especially, um, run towards addiction in, in, in avoiding the self, um, I missed the mention of Cognac. Well, that's the one I like. <laughs> oh, no, I confess to that. So, I stand accused. No, but so, go right ahead. So, yeah, <laughs> saying accused, is it, would, would, you, would you say that is um, identical to the use of the same cognac in the church, um, which could be looked at as the, the allowing of pleasure in particular sections mm. of society and then mm. that pleasure being performed? Yes, indeed. I mean, because the thing is, none of these things in and of themselves are inherently dominating. It's how they're used and how they're deployed. You see. 
Uh, if Muhammad Ali is drinking cognac and still knocking folk out, cognac is playing a very important role relative to what his telos is. If he's drinking cognac and getting knocked out, he needs to check himself. Well, so it is in our existential life. So it is in our religious life. You go in the synagogue and you're picking up on something that's disempowering you and leading you toward hatred and, and contempt, you need to reread Amos, reread Isaiah. Same is true in the church. You go into church, 61% of the folk coming out of the church in American evangelical style voting for Trump, there's some hemorrhage taking place. Something's going on. Something's getting in the way. See what I mean? So that when you talk about cognac, it, I, mean, I'm, I don't want to get evangelical about cognac, but it can be a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> it can be a beautiful thing. But I've been drinking cognac for 40 years, you know. So that to the degree to which it helps produce the fruit that I'm trying to produce, which is truth telling and witness bearing. I'm gonna keep drinking. <laughs> now, once the doctor tell me I can't do it, when you see it, I'm gonna go on and on. But, but you're absolutely right. Now, if I were to end up in a crack house on crack cocaine, whatever, and all of a sudden was debilitated for doing what my calling is, what my mission is, and I can't produce any fruit anymore, just plumage and foliage, but no fruit, then I've got to check myself. I think that's true for our institutions. That's true for ourselves as individuals. Very, very much so. Does that, does that make sense, Robert? I know you'll be just for it. I appreciate that, because he and I, we, we're good friends. We're close brothers, so he understands. Uh, uh, he understands my cognac. Uh, it's not an addiction. It's, it's not an addiction. It's not an addiction. It's just something I like to do. You know? I'm, I'm not addicted to Luther Vandross, but I listen to him all the time. But uh, uh, any, uh, other sisters, female, before we move and continue this conversation. I'd like to better jump right in. Thank you. Uh, I just wonder where the hope lies in Freud. Oh, good question. <laughs> because the sense of nihilism is something I've not been able to reconcile with. All other philosophies offer hope. All other philosophies offer some stage at which man or woman should aspire to be to uh, be at. We're either chasing God or this proverbial sense of happiness. Freud just leads you down this hole and says, it's pretty ordinary. Welcome. Um, but there's, there's nothing bad about being told you're ordinary, if you really are ordinary. And we are ordinary. So he's telling the truth at that point. Very much so. I mean, he, that line where he says, religions cannot keep their promises. You all remember that line? That's a powerful line, especially for those working with religion. And tied to promissory oriented religion. It can't keep its promises. Well, he's got a right to say that. That means we have to provide some kind of response back. You're a religious person, you're going to have to provide a response to Freud. That might be a good subject for a paper. But it, I think there is hope in Freud because he's not committed to suicide. He's still concerned about helping patients, he's still writing magnificent texts. Civilization of discontent is a classic and will be a classic until civilization explodes. Even if he's wrong. Most classics are wrong. But they got insight, even though all, their conclusion might be wrong. Look at Plato's Republic. Oh my God. Classic among classic among classic. Wrong on almost every page. But the, con the, but the const constellation of the flow of the dramatic dialogues, unprecedented in terms of pushing us to come to terms with what it is to be, what it is to be human. So is there hope in Freud? Very, very, very threadbare hope to the degree to which he still is true to his work. He still has a love. He still has a movement. He's still involved in trying to in some way engage in a kind of tikkun alum, a kind of repair of the world, but not in any way putting forward a hope that's associated with religious tradition. Yes. How do we allow memory to be an achievement rather than a continual source of suffering and guilt? How do we distinguish uh, remembrance as a way to penetrate goodness rather than something that we as a species tend to be especially good at um, lashing ourselves repeatedly and repeatedly for, for past mistakes? How do we distinguish between those? Well, that's a beautiful question. 
me ask you this. Do you see Freud making that distinction and what kind of standards and criteria is he using that allow us to make that distinction in, in civilization that's discontent? No. I think you're right. I don't think you're right. He doesn't provide. He doesn't provide. No. But he's very honest. Remember when he talks about remembrance, he talks about the ability to forget too. And the ability to forget, Janice face, good and bad. Get the wrong things, allow the hurtful things to come back. Just like in our own lives, you know, we're dependent, we're haunted by some of the ugly things that happen over and over and over again every day of your life. There's got to be some maturation, there's got to be some way in which you can be transformed so that your memory and your ways of forgetting are much more empowering rather than disempowering. So we know it's tied to some form of empowering. He doesn't really say. Now, does Marcuse provide it? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Marcuse wants to argue, in fact, that there's a, a notion. He's way out here. He's almost like Fourier. There's a super id. Remember that paper they invoked in the footnote? A super id. Oh, you never heard of such a thing. A super id. So that it's non-rational, but it still has authority, and it can be recuperated in such a way that it allowed you to engage in a great refusal against structures of domination, repression, and renunciation. Ooh. Now that's, that's pretty far out. Now that's pretty far out. That's almost like a unicorn and centaur. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's out there. But if it's an illuminating, empowering illusion, Freud said, I mean, Mark Huger says, that's what we all do anyway. That's what we all do anyway. So in that way, we want to be clear, well, what does he mean by empowering? What does it mean by enabling illusion? When he wrote Future of an Illusion, 1927, he said religion was infantile, it was childish, and anybody who held on to it needed to grow up. It showed a lack of maturity and cowardice. He changed his mind. The first chapter that you all read in Civilization was a response to who? Roman Roland, right? What did Roman, Roman, Roman Roland say? No, Freud. The origin of religion is oceanic feeling. It's the sense of being tied to something bigger than you, like being standing out in front of the ocean and realizing your relative insignificance, but you being continuous with that grand something bigger than you. And Freud says, oh my God, Roland, you know, you actually got a point. Maybe I'm wrong about religion as being wholesale air, it's really certain about certain truths that has been distorted that are coming through institutional means and <coughs> psychic means and cultural means, and maybe we can recover something. <coughs> and so it becomes part of a limitless narcissism. That's the phrase that he uses. Now that is thoroughly paradoxical. Limitless narcissism is the, the emergence of an ego that is so connected with the world that is continuous with the world. It's, oce it's the oceanic feeling that Roland was talking about. Now, he doesn't go into this, and he moves from that first chapter responding to Roland into his own theory, of, 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 of his cultural theory of where we are at that time, 1929, 1930. But, uh, but your question is one that we should keep on the table. Keep on the table, because it's very important in terms of forgetting, remembering. Getting this debate right now in terms of these Confederate Confederate statues, right? America, what do you want to remember? America, what do you want to forget? That's always intellectually, ideologically, existentially contentious. Harvard, what do you want to remember? What do you want to forget? You gotta remember something. You gotta forget something. What goes into that? that process as something that can empower the best of Harvard's institution of America as an empire in this country and whatever this is. Those are very important queries. Should we jump into your... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and continue the discussion. Sure, sure, sure. So my interpretation of the place of today's theme in our project here in the course <coughs> Uh, is that here we have an opportunity, a provocation, to deal with the relation between our moral projects, the main subject matter here, 
and our natural constitution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in particular, with respect to the readings that are assigned for today, the necessity, the character, and the fate of what the Freudians and the Neo-Freudians call repression. The repression of our natural constitution as the condition of social life. Now, I'm going to proceed in four steps. Uh, first, I want to say something about the general character of desire. And the question is whether we should think of desire as somehow an exception to the organized structure of our experience, our social experience, as something that's outside it and threatening it, or as one more domain in which the characteristic uh, nature of our experience becomes manifest. Then in the second part of my remarks, I want to step back and ask, what is the metaphysical basis, the general philosophical view, on the foundation of which we can deal with this question, and indeed with all of the questions in the course? We haven't really addressed this yet in the course, the relation between morals and metaphysics. But this particular subject that we deal with today seems to me to require some, some engagement with this. Uh, as I hope to suggest to you. Then in the third part of my remarks, I want to uh, indicate the political consequences of the way of thinking that I'm going to propose. And in particular, its consequences for the Freudian idea of repression in society. And finally, in the fourth part of my remarks, the moral significance of this way of thinking, its significance for these first order moral projects that are our central subject here. So first of all, desire. So the, the basic approach to desire uh, in these readings, in Freud and in the Neo-Freudians, is Desire is this great material, this seething ocean outside society. And society is, as it were, a bulwark, a, a fortress, a citadel against this surrounding force, this brute, irreducible force of our natural constitution. Now, the argument I want to make is that that's not the right way to think about desire that uh, our desire has a structure which is a variant of the same structure of all the rest of our experience and is not, as it were, some strange primitive exception to our experience. What are the basic characteristics of human desire? The first characteristic is that Desire, human desire, is indeterminate. We don't have a fixed set of instincts that we can describe in the old instinct theory of the study of animals that, that have particular rigid objects and expressions. Human desire is relatively empty. It is roving. It is restless. And it is never satisfied in the end with any particular object. The second characteristic of human desire is that it is mimetic. Because it is empty, uh, a large part of what we desire, we desire because other people desire it. So the characteristic experience of human desire involves a kind of kidnapping of the self by the others. Uh, and this kidnapping is one of the deep sources of our ambivalence to the others. Mm. So we desire, we desire the others, but we recognize that our desires are not completely us. 
but the result of this taking of us by the others. And this becomes one of the many elements mm. that threaten to poison our relation to the others and help explain the irreducible element of ambivalence in the relation <coughs> among people. Uh, in one of the essays that we read uh, of, uh, of Emerson, Emerson says, imitation is suicide. And we all understand uh, that this kidnapping involves a destruction of the self. And it is a fundamental element of the experience of desire. A third characteristic of human desire is that human desire is projected. We, human desire fixes on a particular objects, but it's as if it were always pointing beyond itself to something else. So it wants that thing for the sake of some other thing. But what is this other thing for the sake of which it wants the other, the, uh, that thing? The other thing is always irreducibly obscure. <laughs> the other thing is what? This, this, this demand, this assurance that we have an unconditional place in the world, which the others are never able <laughs> sufficiently to give us. So we, we, we have experiences in which this strange character of desire, uh, it's fixing on something and yet pointing beyond that thing, but not knowing to what it's pointing, becomes manifest. For example, the experience of addiction or obsession, in which this other thing, as it were, this, this indeterminate higher thing becomes fixated, folded back on the narrow thing, as if it were like a, a, a disc that got stuck in a certain place. And this produces a characteristic anguish, because we know this is a denial of our, of our true nature. So this is what human desire is really like. And uh, this is an expression of what all of our experience is like in all of the departments of experience and what I, in an earlier class, tried to describe under this label of embodied spirit, mm -hmm. that we are, we're formed in a particular context, a social and cultural uh, world that we, that we inhabit, that makes us who we are, and we uh, are in, embodied in a particular body, uh, and yet all of this particular structure does not wholly contain us. We go beyond. That is the That is the fundamental attribute of human experience: that it is context-bound and embodied, and yet transcendent. And from this, all from this fundamental fact about us arise all the contradictions of our experience. So uh, a, a claim I'm making is that this fundamental character of human desire is misrepresented by Freud and by the Freudians. Mm -hmm. And they invite us to have a way of understanding desire, which is a misrepresentation. Desire is not an exception. Desire is just uh, another manifestation of who we really are. Now, there is a residue of truth in this Freudian conception of desire, which is that uh, any given social and conceptual world fails to do justice to us. That's this idea of transcendence. There's always more in us than there is in that world. We spill over. There's an excess, a surfeit. And this surfeit remains as an inchoate possibility uh, outside society and can be expressed in our cravings, in all of our natural cravings, which then become, as it were, the vehicles of this, of what's not accounted for in the established structure. 
But that's not just something about the natural versus the human. That's once again something about this fundamental character of ours as embodied spirits who are not fully accounted for by the particular reality that we reveal and inhabit. So then we have these experiences in which uh, we try to escape the social world in some way through material stuff and through desire. And characteristically, we fail. So there is no such escape from the world of interdependence. So one example of this is the relation of the accumulation of material things to social interdependence. This is one of the principles of construction, for example, of the early English novel. The accumulation of things as an alternative to social interdependence. Why do we accumulate things? On this view, one of the reasons why we accumulate things is so as not to depend on people. That's the character of property. Property is an alternative to interdependence. Robinson Crusoe on his island accumulates stuff, so he need not depend on people. Uh, but in the end, Robinson Crusoe wants to return to the company of his countrymen. So the accumulation of stuff is an imperfect substitution for the development of a social world, and this uh, material accumulation, in the end, fails to work. It's, it's not an adequate replacement for interdependence. Similarly, in the experience of lust, the attempt to objectify the other so that the, the concrete reality of the other becomes irrelevant, the other is simply an instrument for some form of self-satisfaction. And by it breaks down repeatedly because the other fails to disappear. And the reality of the other ends up manifesting itself in one way or another. So it is true that through our sensual life or the accumulation of things, we do attempt to escape society. But it is also true that when we attempt to escape society, we fail. Uh, and we fail in a characteristic series of ways. So that's just another way of reaffirming the central idea that we ought not to think of desire as an exception uh, to our normal human experience. Now I come to the second remark, and here's just something especially <coughs> perplexing because it, there's no natural place in, in our course in which to raise this issue, but I think it should be raised sooner or later, and this uh, sooner, sooner rather than later, and this seems like an especially appropriate occasion on which to raise it. So the issue is, on the basis of what general metaphysical views, views about the nature of ultimate reality, should we engage these questions? And here, we have a, a debate about the relation between our moral projects and our natural constitution. And it's, uh, it seems that this, uh, this reflection on the metaphysical foundations and morals uh, mm. becomes inescapable. So uh, here's what I want to say, just by way of introducing this theme in our course that we can pursue in later classes. First, uh, there are two main positions in the world history of philosophy, positions about the nature of ultimate reality and of time. And neither of these two positions seems to be an adequate basis on which to consider the problems that we address in this course. So the first position in the world history of thought is what you could call the project of classical ontology. The canonical figure in our tradition, in the Western tradition, is Aristotle. 
and the classical Greek philosophy of being. This is a dominant element in the whole history of Western philosophy. So here, the central idea is there is an abiding structure in the world, a, a structure of the ultimate constituents of reality, the kinds of being that there are. Uh, which persists. And as there is an abiding structure of, of things, of types of being, there is also a structure of immutable regularities in the world, governing the operation and the interaction of these types of beings. And in the dominant tradition of natural science, these are the laws, the symmetries, and the constants of nature. So uh, the, the spirit of this Greek philosophy of being, of this project of classical ontology, as I'm calling it, persists in the dominant tradition of modern science, and especially in the most foundational science, uh, uh, physics from Galileo and Newton to 20th century relativity and quantum mechanics. It's the same idea. So then what about time in this philosophical view? Time is real. There are real distinctions in the world. But time is not completely real. Time is not completely real because there are two notable exceptions to the reign of time. The basic constituents of the world, of reality, being, which are timeless on this view, and the immutable regularities, the laws of nature. They're outside of time. So time does not go all the way down. Time is, as it were, emergent or derivative or epiphenomenal. And there is an association in this way of thinking between the extent to which something is timeless and the extent to which it is real. So what is most real is what is not time bound, according to this point of view, which is maintained in the dominant tradition of modern science. Now, it's very strange that this Greek philosophy of being should have been appropriated mm -hmm. as a philosophical inspiration by the leading philosophical thinkers of the Semitic salvation religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, notably uh, uh, Aquinas uh, in Christianity, Maimonides in Judaism, and Avicenna in Islam. They accepted this Aristotelian view as the basis for their thinking in religions in which God is represented as a person. Uh, and this seems uh, blasphemous or incompatible with the true nature of reality, with the vision of reality and the narrative of redemption in these religions. But that's what happened. So a 20th century philosopher, Heidegger, once made the following remark. If one day I wrote a theology, the word being would never occur in it. But the word being is at the center of, these, of this philosophical reconstruction of these, mm. of these religions of the Bible. So in this, so there's a problem, which is, that what is central to the moral projects that we're, that we're discussing is uh, personality and personal interaction. Mm. From the standpoint of this philosophy of being is secondary or less real because it is the impersonal and the abiding impersonal structure of reality uh, outside of time which is most real. Now, there's a second position in the world history of philosophy, and it is most notably associated 
with the dominant philosophical traditions in ancient India and in some other places. We could, we could call it the monistic view. So according to the monistic view, the divisions among things in the world, among types of being, are all shallow or illusory. Or at least they're less real than the abiding unified structure of being. There's, in the end, just one being, which in evanescent form manifests itself in these variations. These variations are not real, or much less real. And this one being is outside of time. So time itself is an illusion. This is the second position in the world history of thought. And this second position is also subversive of the, the thinking which we've been developing here about these moral projects, which depend on the centrality of the interpersonal connections, on the reality of the divisions among things and among people, and the fateful unilinear character of historical time, not an illusion, but the real thing. So, you would, so then there would be a third position, which would be the position required for, as the philosophical background uh, to this uh, thinking that we attempt here in the course. The third position would say, the divisions among things and beings in the world and people are real. They're not illusory, but they're not for keeps. There's no abiding structure. There's nothing outside of time. All the divisions that exist in the world and all the regularities of the world are mutable. So the thing that is most real is time. Uh, and time goes all the way down. Now, here's just a fact, a, an astonishing fact about the history of thought. Uh, you would think that this third view is the view which seems to be required by the thinking like the thinking we're trying to do here about these first order moral projects. And it seems to be supported by much in the empirical discoveries of contemporary science, modern science, including the discovery that the universe has a history. The universe is historical. We know for a fact that there was a time in the history of the universe when uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the regularities and constants of nature, as we now understand them, uh, did not hold. Uh, the, the basic constituents of matter, as described in the periodic table, uh, had not come into existence. They all have a history. Uh, and so there's nothing outside of time. Now, that third position does not exist, for the most part, as a systematic position in the history of thought. It doesn't exist. So, so the claim that I'm making now is that the metaphysical background that we would require for this effort here uh, has not been developed as a comprehensive position in the history of thought. Astonishing. So now uh, the second, second, uh, uh, now a second observation I want to make on this issue of the, of the philosophical background to morals. If we now focus on modern Western philosophy, we see that its most striking characteristic is the rule of a series of dualisms that have dominated the history of modern thought. And there have been four main waves of these dualisms. I'm just going to mention them without describing them in detail. So first, in the late Middle Ages, uh, what we often call nominalist theology, but could more accurately be described as dualist theology, there's a realm of nature and a realm of grace, dualism. Then there's a second wave associated with the philosophy of Descartes, Cartesian dualism. There's a fundamental distinction, a discontinuity, between mental experience, Descartes calls race, race cogitans, 
and stuff in space, race extensa. Then there's a third dualism associated with Kant between the noumenal and the phenomenal. Our characteristic human experience, whether it's cognitive or moral, depends on presuppositions mm -hmm. that can't be made sense of in naturalistic terms. And then we come to the fourth dualism, which is the dualism of uh, historical and social thought, historicist dualism. The self-construction of society in history cannot be understood in natural terms. There's a discontinuity between the world of nature and the world of society. And this discontinuity is associated with different ways of understanding. So Vico, for example, says we can understand the structures, the institutions of society, because we made them. So we understand them from the inside, as the creator understands his creation. But our insight into nature is always from the outside. So it's a fundamentally different relation. So there's this discontinuity. And so, so long as these dualisms hold, this dualistic view of reality, our whole experience of the personal, the interpersonal, and the social seems to be a kind of unexplained or arbitrary exception to natural reality. And a consequence of particular interest to our subject today is that the body, the human body, under the rule of these dualisms, appears to us as if it were a stranger because it's on the other side of this divide, of this chasm, described by the different, by the different dualisms. So what's the, then the conclusion of these, this stage of my remarks? Mm -hmm. It's that we're in trouble, philosophically, <laughs> because, because we, we, for, to, for, the, for the development of these ideas, we require a view, a metaphysical view, a view of reality that we don't have. Uh, and, and the views that we do have, either through the influence of the classical philosophy of being, perpetuated by the dominant tradition in modern science, uh, or by these successive waves of dualism, are fundamentally antagonistic to what we would need by way of philosophical clarification. Uh, so now I go on to the third, to the third set of remarks. So the third set of remarks is now about the political implications of this way of thinking uh, about desire. Desire is not an exception. And of thinking, of struggling to think, despite the unavailability of an adequate metaphysical background. In my second set of remarks. So the Freudian picture is there's repression. Civilization depends on repression of the sensual, of our natural constitution. And then it's sort of turned over in Fourier or in the neo-Freudian with this idea that we'll defeat repression. And the euphoric manifestation of this is in Fourier's idea. Society becomes a <coughs> perpetual orgy. So uh, this is like a fantastical idea, because it's not really a transformative engagement with the experience that the theory of repression claims to describe. It's sort of a denial of it. So it's like what you call bad utopia. Bad utopia is it's not a, 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 the imagination of an accessible series of transformations. It's simply the reversal of a reality. So it's the, it's the counter image, the, the image upside down of the thing that we denounce. Uh, so we have to have a different view, and a view which is both more realistic and more inviting of transformation. So politically, here, here's the, the rudimentary, the, the, the rudiments, the point of departure of such a view just to suggest to you an example. 
uh, in these societies that now exist, um, if we first focus narrowly on the economic level, we find that there is a contradiction that is enormously suggestive. For the individual, the economic agent, as a worker, as a producer, there must be discipline and repression. Uh, and until recently, the dominant organization of production, mass production, came under a command and control system uh, that was quasi-military. But the economic, for the economic agent as a consumer, it's the opposite. So consumption is inflamed, is aroused, uh, and which is a direct appeal to the sensual nature and, uh, and overcoming of what the Freudians would describe as repression. Now, it's interesting. There's barely an economic theory of production there's absolutely no economic theory of consumption. So this is like a, a black box in our understanding of economic life. But there is a manifest contradiction between the repression of the sensual on the side of production and the arousal of the sensual on the side of consumption. Now let's look at the same ambivalence or contradiction on a broader scale, um, in a broader setting, beyond the merely economic, in the life of the society or of the culture as a whole. The characteristic experience of social life in these societies is an experience of constraint, belittlement, and humiliation, with very few people able to live as who they think they are. But the character of the culture, of the popular culture, is one that arouses constantly the fantasies of empowerment and adventure. That's the central theme of this popular culture, which is the direct denial of uh, the experience of belittlement and constraint. Uh, so once again, outside the economic, in the extra-economic realm, there is this contradiction. This contradiction between belittlement and empowerment. But the empowerment is always as a fantasy. So this, this is the reality of these societies. It's not, it can't adequately be described in this vocabulary of repression. Repression is, as it were, only half of the picture, because then there's the other half. Mm. And what there is, both economically and beyond economics, is this contrast. And the contrast is then a point of departure for transformation. So let me give you an example of the uh, of the discussion of the nature of work. So uh, Karl Marx and John Maynard Keynes both had the following two ideas. So the first idea is scarcity is about to be overcome. We're uh, on the, as it were, on the morrow, of the, on the, in the, in, in the lead up to the overcoming of scarcity. Mm -hmm. The second idea that they had is work is a hateful instrumental burden, which once scarcity is overcome, we can cast aside. Then we can devote ourselves to private sublimity, to hobbies and so forth. Uh, and work will no longer be necessary. Now, I want, want to argue that they were mistaken in both of these ideas. Scarcity is not about to be overcome. Scar scarcity is perpetually recreated in new forms. But the extent to which work needs to be purely instrumental or simply a hateful burden is variable. And 
for example, we discussed here uh, or have begun to discuss the, the fate of the most advanced practice of production, the knowledge economy. Will it remain an insular vanguard from which the great majority of workers and firms are excluded, or will it be disseminated? It is a form of production that requires a much higher level of trust and discretion, and perpetual innovation in which all of the participants in the process of production must participate for it to be successful. But it appears in the contemporary economies only as a series of insular fringes denied to the vast majority of workers and firms. Uh, if it were to be disseminated, it seems that it could not be disseminated so long as economically dependent wage labor remained the predominant form of free labor. Economically dependent wage labor would have to give rise, would have to give way to the higher forms of free labor, self-employment and cooperation. And for this transformation of economic life to be radicalized, the relation of workers to machines would have to change in the way that I suggested in an earlier class. The machine is to do for us what we have learned how to repeat so that all of our time can be reserved for the not yet repeatable. Then the character of work changes. The economy, rather than being just a terrain of constraint, becomes as well, at the same time, a terrain of liberation. So this is not just some vague idea of it's either economic life as usual or it's a perpetual orgy. It turns on the actual institutional transformation of economic life, step by step in relation to these phenomena that exist in the world, such as the change in the practice of production. And the same kind of argument could go on with respect to politics. So all the democracies that exist in the world are relatively weak, flawed democracies that maintain the citizens at a relatively low level of engagement in political life, that perpetuate impasse, slowing down politics and that make it hard to develop counter models of the national future. The result is to perpetuate the rule of the living by the dead and to maintain the dependence of change on crisis. So we have to change these democracies. That's not a fantasy. That's a step-by-step -step process of a series of institutional innovations that would raise the temperature and hasten the pace of political life. Uh, and then it's as if the walls between these contradictions that I described begin to break down step by step. So the fantasies of empowerment begin to have some expression in ordinary economic and political experience. So my argument is, in the spirit of my earlier remarks, that that's the way to think about this problem that they describe as repressing. That this is not some kind of blind, unhistorical fate. That this is about the structure of society. And the structure of society is always susceptible to transformation. To be transformed, it has to be reimagined. Now I come then just to the fourth uh, part of my remarks. And let me maybe preface this by something we were speaking about before class, mm -hmm. which is the philosophy of Kant. Mm -hmm. Because Kant is one of the philosophers associated with his dualism that I described. And yet Kant is at the same time an enemy of this dualism. So in the philosophy of Kant, there are three great questions. What can I know? What should I do, and what should I hope for? So the what should I hope for question is answered to the extent that it is answered in his third great work, the third critique, the critique of judgment, which then has the promise of the reunion, of the uniting of what was separated the natural and the human in the first two critiques. So the general direction, the moral direction in which this way of thinking goes 
is that we can hope, once again, in steps, not in some one big jump, to reunite the human or the moral with the natural. Uh, this is how we think, morally. For example, with regard to the relation of love, a full embodied erotic love to lust on one side and to disinterested altruism on the other. So in this way of thinking, we would say, love is higher. Because love is an experience of reconciliation with the other fully, not just morally, but that embraces our whole natural constitution. Lust is an attempt to escape from this struggle with the other. And altruism is also a kind of escape, because altruism is like this gift from on high, from a distance, without close engagement and without payment of the price of heightened vulnerability. Now, it's not just in, 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 in love that we have this experience or this possibility, but in our whole imaginative life. So, what is the imagination, the subject of Kant's third critique? There are two crucial moves in the imagination. One move is distancing from the immediate phenomenon. And the second move is then the subsumption of the phenomenon under, under a range of transformative possibility. To understand something is to understand what it can become. That's what it means to understand something. And uh, through the exercise of the imagination over time, we lighten the weight of the fixed categorical scheme that weighs on the mind. So we do what no machine can do. We discover something that cannot be accommodated by our established methods and presuppositions. And then after the fact, we uh, change our methods and presuppositions to make sense of what we have discovered. Uh, and in this way, ceasing to be hostage to any rigidified scheme of categories, methods, and presuppositions, we become more receptive to the promptings of experience. And that's a higher form, a higher form of experience, uh, and a, uh, in which our, our natural constitution is reconciled with our liberation. Uh, our ascent to, to a higher form. Uh, and that is, if anything is, what ought to count as a, a, a promise of happiness. Not happiness as the privation of suffering or the suppression of contradiction, but happiness as this uh, deepening and extension of experience. We become more. There's more in us. And we increase our share in the, in the attributes that we ascribe to the divine. So uh, I, it's a, I've, I've made what I think is, is the anti-Freudian argument, but also the anti-Fourier argument, and maintaining, as I will, in every one of our meetings, the cause of transformation and of possibility. Can I, can I just say something? Oh, you don't want to jump. I know she got passion. Go right ahead. Yeah, jump, jump right in. Jump right in. Yeah, I, I just have a question about the, the higher forms of labor that you yes. talked about. As yes. Yes. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Absolutely, absolutely. So you know, the problem is in a in a in an argument like this, I refer to many things, and I refer to all of them in passing as just illusions, and every single statement would justify uh, a very long discussion. So, 
just a moment on this question of labor, because it's an example of how we could take any of these points and, and deepen it. So in the 19th century, the, the universal belief of liberals as well as socialists was that economically dependent wage labor was a transitory and defective form of free labor retaining many of the characteristics of slavery and serfdom. So for example, Abraham Lincoln, in his speech to the Missouri Agricultural Society before the Civil War, says exactly this. No sane free man would accept being a wage laborer if he could avoid it. Uh, when Tocqueville visited the United States in 1830, one in every five free white men worked for another white man. So, the, the, the free part of the population consisted essentially of independent <coughs> proprietors. It was only in the late 19th century that the predominance of wage labor as, a, as, a for, as free labor was naturalized. So that in the 20th century, very recently, we began to think of wage labor, wage, labor that can be bought and sold, as the natural form of free labor. But it was never regarded as the natural form of free labor. It was regarded as just a transition. Huh? Now, then these alternatives, just as you suggest, uh, can appear in perverted forms. So involuntary self-employment, as in the case of the Uber driver, can be a disguise for something that is worse, not better, than wage labor. Because then what it really represents is the legal vehicle of precarious employment. In other words, a degeneration of the labor contract. So we have to, of course, look beneath the surface to the substance. But my simple point in that part of the argument is that the extent to which our economic and political life is repressive or emancipatory depends on a host of detailed institutional arrangements. Uh, once we begin to ch change those arrangements piece by piece, then our conception of the extent to which the regime is repressive must change. Now, we, we're, we, we have trouble because just as we have no adequate metaphysical background, we have no adequate social theoretical background. So the dominant intellectual tradition of the left comes from Marxism. Marxism teaches that there are these, this small menu of regimes in world history, feudalism, capitalism, socialism. Each of them is an indivisible system. Therefore, politics must be either the revolutionary substitution of the system or the reformist management of it. And there are laws of historical transformation governing the foreordained succession of these systems. All of that is false. It's not true. And it's not believed in now, in general, by the leftists. But that's how we're used to thinking about structure. That's not how structural change happens. Structural change happens piecemeal. And it can be revolutionary in its outcome if it persists in a certain direction. So what I'm saying is that once we begin thinking structurally and thinking about structural alternatives in this experimental and piecemeal form, our understanding of the fate of repression changes. Mm, mm. I guess my question is what happens when that repression is piecemeal and sort of invokes a pressing structural systemic, but a, a substitution for a reimagination of economic substitution. So I'm not sure I understand. The point the point is the point is that that it, it's not as if this were a, that we should approach these problems as simply a contest of alternative descriptions of the same reality, a pessimistic description or an optimistic description. The point is that the reality itself is porous and subject to transformation. But the way it really changes is in little pieces. And so w once we understand that, then our whole experience of social life, of the social setting of human experience, becomes something that's movable. 
and and that is that that that's how we should think. So one of the things that happened here in this literature that we're reading today in the in the Freudian part is that the uh, at a certain point of the European leftists uh, despaired of structural change in society. It didn't happen the way they wanted or expected the substitution of capitalism by socialism. And it's as if they said, well, then let's change the subject. So the subject is now personal experience and consciousness, the flight into consciousness. And that's not the way to go, according to this argument, that, that change in consciousness to be real rather than to be just a lie, a fiction, a cover-up, must always be associated with structural change, uh, understood in a different way. Let mm -hmm. me just ask a quick question having yes. to do with the, um, the philosophical differences between you and Freud. So I want to defend Freud for a second. That Freud would argue that those who talk about change and transformation really have a deep fear of helplessness and impotence and silence and sleep and death and rest. This, there are elements in the human experience that lead you to helplessness in which the religious question, William James says in the the call for help yeah. and the silence period. You can't skip over that. And you can jump the structure transformation all you want. And that's important. But the same way I tell my young brothers and sisters in, in the Black, black, uh, black uh, Lives movie, stay woke, stay woke. Well, you're going to suffer from insomnia. You better get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's not a cliche. We're talking about staying fortified for a movement over decades. And the only way you stay fortified for moving over decades is you have to be able to have spiritual and moral resources to deal with all of the different elements in the human condition, including your experiences of helplessness and impotence and sleep and rest and death and dread and so forth. So that there's a sense in which you do accept extinction. I mean, when you talk about uh, mortality, you're talking about death. You would probably agree with that. Right? Yes. It's time all the way down. Yes. And after that, boom, you're helpless in terms of you know, from the terms yes. of that. So that same is true in terms of rest. Now, I know we, we won't get into your sleep habits, but I mean, you, you work hard all the time. This, <laughs> this, this restlessness yes. that goes hand in hand with transformation, change, yes. revolutionary spirit on fire, waves of thought. Freud says, you're going to run up against a stone wall because if you don't con con focus also on what will sustain you in moments of helplessness, you're going to run out of gas anyway. Yes. So what do you say to such a uh, crypto quasi Freudian response? Well, there's not one one thing to say, right? So, <laughs> so first, so first I, I, I guess I, I stated my position with respect to part of what you say right. in our very first class. So when I described those irreparable defects yeah, in the a, human condition, so uh, a great deal of the history of philosophy and of religion consists in these lullabies that teach us that <laughs> there really aren't these irreparable flaws. But they are. They are. They, they, they are our existence is flawed in those ways. and. Uh, a tormented, unquiet, dreamlike, vertiginous, uh, and it's on that condition that we are then aroused from what what Emerson calls a conformity. So that's the condition in which we come to life. Huh? Uh, so there's no denial of that, uh, and. Uh, in, in your account, then, of this experience of our situation of relative powerlessness in the world, I think there's something crucial that has to be added mm. in, with respect to personal experience and the psychology of hope. So for the individual, what is crucial is not 
that there is or there is not collective transformation, structural change. Mm -hmm. Structural change is, is, is vital. It determines in the long term the character of our experience. Right. What is crucial right. for the individual is the experience of agency, that the individual have the experience of acting, uh, of turning the tables on his circumstance, intellectual action, practical action. This is the most fundamental theme in the psychology of hope. Hope is not a consequence of action, a, a cause of action. Hope is a consequence of action. So the, 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 the passive position is a position that generates a contemplative and fatalistic attitude. Uh, it, it's, it's by engagement, by acting, that we acquire hope. That's how it works. It's, it's this experience that we have through action of transformative possibility. And so hope is not like optimism. Hope is not a prediction of some future state. Hope is an existential attitude. It's, it's, it's the shadow of action in which we change our, our, our relation to the world. We do need intellectual clarification. So the, 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 the absence of an adequate metaphysical background and the absence of an adequate social theoretical position complicate our situation. Mm. Because then mm. we can be deluded, confused, disoriented by a series of intellectual illusions that come from the history of philosophy and of social theory. And therefore, we have an interest in this clarification. But it's, it's, it's a clarification so that we not be discouraged and disoriented in this experience of agency. Mm, mm, mm. Last question before we go. Yes. 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 Dominated by yes. Correct. Yes. Yes. So that's this momentous question that has come up from time to time already in the course of the relation between historical time and biographical time. So the collective transformation happens in historical time. And uh, uh, not in the time of our lifetimes. So. And we don't get to choose our point in history, as you, as you suggest. So then one way to think about these moral projects is that, in a sense, they have to make up for the deficiencies of politics. That is, we have to discover a way of living in the world as beings that are not totally controlled by the present circumstances of our existence that uh, allows us to, to, to to compensate for the deficiencies of our historical situation. Uh, and that's the, this argument that we've begun about where do we look beyond the images that we have available to us, the image of Christian charity, the image of romantic adventure. They all seem to be inadequate. And what I'm trying to do in my interventions in the courts as we go, go along is little by little begin to fill in the picture of these moral orientations in an attempt to respond precisely to the question you just asked. That seems to me to be the, 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 uh, the vital issue, that we, that we understand that part of this transformation is social and historical, but part is about us and, and can't depend then on the historical transformation of society. But, but to think in the right way, we can't be confused by these philosophical or social theoretical illusions as we are. And that's, and that's, the, that's the need for intellectual clarity. We've run out of time, Cornell. Oh, okay, no, I guess we can sneak one in, but okay. Next week we shall continue.
Yeah, the problem is there's so much stuff, right? There's so much Because, for example, this issue that I call... Thank you. 